A certain physicist claims we have done something evil and it's being hidden. We're talking about the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. A physicist from CERN, Dr. Edward Mantil, reported about an incident that took place at CERN. And according to his report, the incident had an impact on our world. And this is his report. He says, my name is Dr. Edward Mantil, and I was technically still am a physicist at CERN located in Geneva, Switzerland. I specialize in particle physics and subatomic research, focusing on quark interactions. In other words, I study very small particles and how they interact with one another at very high speeds. Until Thursday, January 15, 2014, I was a normal scientist living and working on the CERN campus. Most of the scientists who are involved in the branch of research that I am, li that I am live on campus at the facility in Geneva and venture out only for social activities on the occasional visit home and the occasional visit home. Most of you who have heard of CERN will have heard of the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, the largest scientific instrument which exceeds 20 miles in diameter and travels under the sovereign territory of two countries, Switzerland and France. The public has been told that it was constructed at a cost of tens of billions of euros for the purpose of studying the birth of the universe and the collisions that take place within the collider allow us a quick glimpse at certain phenomenon that can only be witnessed when particles hit one another at incredibly high, high rates. This is not what the machine was designed for, nor is it what the machine has been used for since its inception. CERN's main purpose is for building the collider was to, well, it was to open a doorway. Allow me to explain. The doorway idea came into fruition in the 1960s. After years and years of attempting to hide UFO phenomenon, including large scale and very public interactions such as the Roswell incident and the battle uh, for Los Angeles, that's where the UFOs were over Los Angeles, the incident well before that, the governments of the United States, Great Britain, France, decided to throw their weight behind the understanding of what precisely these objects were. The ideas flew far and wide. Were UFOs from other planets? Were they from another time? Or were they simply mass hysteria and mass delusion fueled by the overactive imagination of a public who were shared, he says here, shit scared, of communists and their technology? No, they were none of those. Our universe is but one page in a large book. Think of a closed book sitting on a table. You see each page stacked on top of one another, bound by the spine and sandwiched between the two covers. Our universe is but one page in a vast and all-encompassing book, and our page is certainly not the one with rich and in-depth thought and writing committed to it. Every page in the book represents a different dimension, each with its own unique writing, own unique story, own unique way of isolating itself from the other pages. No page was to interact with the other, just as no ink bleeds from one page to another in a standard book. Each page a universe unto itself. Within a few short years of mathematical research and fleets of scientists working under threat of extermination should they share their research, the book idea was finally cemented. Though many disagree, the mathematics were there to support the book idea, and the mathematics also showed us that it was impossible for one page to interact with another. That was until the 1980s. During the 1980s, billions of billions of dollars of research were funneled into the idea that if we use enough energy, if we used enough force concentrated into a small area the size of a pinprick, we could theoretically tear our page and get a glimpse of the page next to ours, we could open a door from their universe to ours. When the family, the code name for the group, group of scientists that function as the head of each of their departments uh, at CERN, were shown the initial presentation in March of 1981, many of them expressed grave concern about the ramifications of opening such a doorway. But in the beautiful name of science, the family decided to share these ideas with the governments who constantly funneled their research. At a meeting held in Luxembourg, 
the heads of state of the newly formed European Union, along with the United States and China, were shown plans for the construction of a colossal machine that would enable the opening of a doorway that could be closed at our discretion. The door would be opened and the energy levels would be measured to prove that CERN had accomplished its task and the door would be closed, open, shut, simple as that. The government leaders threw endless funding at the family and the rest of CERN in the hopes of understanding what kind of power lay in other universe. Think of the possible endless source of energy, faster than light travel, weaponry that could obliterate enemies using laser, the possibilities of power are truly staggering. So the public was fed, was fed on a narrative, understanding the universe, quote unquote, and the family and governments knew the truth. Most of the scientists at CERN were kept completely in the dark after all the collider would perform its function as normal and collide particles for eager funding, hunting hunters to capitalize on. But the, uh, the far more nefarious purpose would only be tested in the presence of the family and a few select scientists. I'm a member of the family from my division. Obviously, the original family have all retired or died out, but there is a new younger, more eager to prove themselves group now at the helm. And the consequences of this uh, and are, uh, uh, the consequence of this were and are dire. So with that established, allow me to explain what happened uh, recently. It was an ordinary day with the LHC scheduled to commit two collisions, one at 9 a.m. and the other at 6.30 p.m. Both went off magnificently and the experiments were deemed a success. We witnessed two full collisions and the general group of researchers were very happy with their work. Around 7 p.m., that's after the second collision, most of the team had filtered out of the observation room and the machine had been put into its usual standby mode. As the room emptied, the ID clip that I had on my waist, which had a built-in display and vibrator, started to go off. I looked down at the display and it said in very faint green writing, living room. I knew right away what they were going to attempt. I looked up from the badge and caught the eyes of Dr. Celine Dacord, another member of the family, at the head of the plasma physics. She too had just looked up from her ID badge. We both understood and left living room was a large room under the main facility located in A section. The room was not special in any way and appeared completely normal. This was key to hiding our true intentions. If we met in a secret underground bunker instead of a regular basement, we'd arouse suspicion, suspicion every time we were going to run an experiment. As Celine and I made our way from the collision to section A, the collider to section A, the cold Swiss air hit my face and burned as we booked it across the campus. The night was exceptionally clear, and this factor further bolstered my suspicion. They always liked doing these experiments on clear nights. We entered Section A and made our way to the main building. The doors opened as we approached, and we made our way to the elevators across the wide expanse of a lobby with the vaulted ceilings. The RFID signal given off by our name badges caused the elevator doors to open before we had ever pressed the button. As we stepped in, the doors shut and the elevator began to move. I'll never get used to that, Celine said, referring to the degree of automation that the buildings displayed. We had been scheduled for a meeting in the living room and the building knew, so all strategic lights were on, the elevators were reading, were reading we, we are, uh, where we needed to go. The miracle of networking. We exited the lift and made our way to the regular boardroom. The door was shut and assembled inside was the family. At the head of the table was father, a young, rather ambitious physicist named Sandra O'Reilly, designated father, quote unquote, since she was in charge of giving orders to the family with respect to our clandestine experiments. The mood in the living room was never tense, but rather one of controlled excitement. The family had been attempting these tests once every six months for the past 10 years without much success. We had gone through several fathers, quote unquote, from the great Dr. Bertram Berg to the lesser known and constantly drunk Dr. Yao, each had failed to achieve what the original family had planned. 
Billions were spent, but no door had yet been opened. Tonight we try 40 tera electron volts, Father announced, announced. Her announcement brought an immediate and total silence to the room. Family members looked from one to the other. Some were feigned with feigned excitement, others with revered concern, uh, and all, all with a general sense of disbelief. The last four trials were between 10 to 20 dV teravolts. We've never tried anything that high. We don't know if the machine can handle a test of that magnitude, protested Dr. Akava, head of mathematical physics and chief of the department that should be certifying whether or not 40 TeV was even a healthy thing to do. We have reviewed the possible outcomes, and even though we will have to pull twice the amount of energy out of the grid, the Swiss government had been advised in our cooperating, Father quickly re re retorted. Her sweet, controlled tone actually did help the situation. I looked over and Celine had been frantically writing down some calculations on a piece of paper. After a few seconds, she sought up from her seat. Father, even if we try to reach 40 teravolts, the math does not support that this is possible, she said. We can't just throw the collider into the highest setting and hope for the best. Are there any other objections that you would like noted before we begin the experiment, Father asked completely ignoring Celine's desperate pleas. Father surveyed the room and could see that she was going to be met with other objections. After all, what was the point? They were going to go unheeded. Excellent, when they shall, when, then we shall proceed. Meet in the control room at 22 hours. That's 11 o'clock in the evening. Father announced as the family got up from the table and left the living room. No one said a word. We left in complete silence made our way into the lift and exited the building into the cold Swiss night. If the machine could not handle the electron voltage, it could become structurally unstable and break apart. But being buried underground prevented this from being a catastrophe. There would not be loss of life, but the LHC would be rendered useless and billions of dollars worth of funding would be destroyed. On the other hand, if the experiment was successful and the door opened, could we close something functioning on 40 terravolts? Our math had supported 10 and 20 volts, even 30 terravolts, but no one had dared to go above that. However, this is where our role as scientists ended and our regrettable role of secret experimenter began. All we could do was say yes, and at 2200 hours, with the family assembled in the control room, and the handful of select certain employees who understood the true nature of the experiment milling around, we commenced our grand try. Begin was the order, uh, the only order the father issued. The family members at the control entered the required programming to begin the collider, and so our fateful experiment began. Release the first particle sample, came the command. A few seconds later, the sound of gas entered the collider could be heard, the gas started its 20 plus mile journey around the collider, gaining more and more speed. Release the second particle. Another sound of whooshing gas entered the tube and traveling into the opposite direction as the first. Both gained speed, traveling faster and faster, approaching the speed of light, like two runners running through a circular track in opposite directions, not touching one another. Father, we are approaching 30 TV, one of the com commander, 30 teravolts, one of the commanders warned. Excellent. Increase the energy to 35 teravolts within the next three minutes. Father commands once again brought grave concern. If anything was going to happen, it was going to happen now. Increase to 35 teravolts came the announcement over the intercom system. We all continued to look at one another the concern growing graver and graver, achieving 38 tel terravolts, another announcement, but nothing, no explosion, no catastrophic failure, nothing. In theory, 40 was possible, but never advisable. However, at 38, no specific structural damage signs were noted, nothing. 40 terravolts achieved. We looked at one another in astonishment. We had achieved what we thought was impossible. 40 teravolt of energy was pushing the particles through the collider, and we were sustaining it. As the two particles, particle clouds whizzed past each other, our first indication that something different was going to happen started to occur. There was a sudden spike in the temperature of the room, 
we could feel that it had gotten warmer, and the first reaction was one of panic. Shut the machine down, came the first exclamation from a family member. The machine is heating up. Explosion will be imminent. She continued, wait, exclaimed father, her eyes growing with the reflection of the computer screen in front of her. Look at the core temperature readout. They have not changed. They're perfectly normal, she said. We each looked at the uh, closest computer screen we could find, all of them showing that everything was going well, except for the fact that the thermostat in the room now read 35 degrees Celsius when we started out at the pleasant 20. Could this be it? Commence the collision sequence, father barked the order into the microphone under her control console. Collision in four, three, two, and the methodical voice announced over the intercom one, an ethereal blinding light consumed the room. I had never experienced anything like this before. The temperature dropped back down to 20 degrees, but the light was overpowering us. 20 degrees Celsius we're talking about. And the light was overpowering us. We could not see our own hands in front of our faces. Suddenly there was a blood-curdling scream, like something being horribly beaten, followed by complete and total silence and then darkness. Is everyone okay? Celine was shouting from her side of the room. I'm fine, I called back. Sound off, mantle code FAM0113, decord code FAM0115, chunk code family 110114. The family members present started uh, present started to scream out their names and code designation as our eyes adjusted to the total darkness that had encompassed the room. With the sound of a bang, the emergency red lighting bathed the room in a, lamp, a lambent grow, glow. We could make out shadows, but no distinguished features. By this time, approximately two minutes after our encounter with the white light, we still had not heard father sound off. Where is father? Dr. Chung uh, called out. We all turned to the seat that father was in and could see a lump on the chair, but no sign of her. I entered the panel code to open the emergency exit and made my way through the escape corridor to the lighting box at the end of the hall. I turned the breaker and the normal lighting filled the room again. Panic struck for father's well-being. I turned and ran back into the control room. All of my fellow scientists were in complete and total awe. Nothing in the room was out of place, and the temperature had returned to normal. However, sitting in father's chair was a pile of her effects. Celine ran up to the chair father once filled and looked down with a gasp. She's gone. All of her things are here, her jewelry, her clothes, her tamp, everything. Where father sat now rested her physical possessions. She had vanished into thin air. And this is Unbended Reality, and this is what uh, Dr. Edward Mantill reported concerning this incident. Please leave your comments and thank you for your support. I finally support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.